What is now? How long has it been now? How much longer will it be before thinking about this moment becomes a reflection on the past? Did it happen just now? If I think of a question to ask now in a video I'll make later, is that question coming to you from my past or your future? If you're watching this now, have I already finished making this now? Did you know I was about to ask that? If not, don't worry, it's in the past. But is there ever a present? Was that it? Or is it coming up in a little bit? I was going to start talking about the past, but I think I might have become trapped in a temporal paradox where everything I think I'm about to do has already happened, and I'm only now finding out about it. And all of this has put me even further behind. While we're here, it seems like we might as well forge ahead with a look back. Here are some things that definitely happened long before any semblance of what could be considered now. Starting out, as many kids in the 80s and 90s did, I grew up with BMX style bikes. This one in particular is a very 90s paint splattered Huffy. At the time, I didn't know anything about bicycle brands. I would come to find out that Huffy was sort of looked down upon in the world of BMX riding, but to me it was pretty cool. The main thing that I wished I could have changed about this bike was that it had a coaster brake, which is a simple mechanism in the rear hub that applies friction when the pedals are pushed backwards. While this meant that you could do incredible rear wheel skids with ease, it also meant that you could not pedal backwards freely. I was always so jealous of neighborhood kids who had freewheel BMX bikes, and I tried on several occasions to remove the brake mechanism from the hub, likely ruining it in the process. I believe this bike was also my first to be equipped with a cat eye cyclo computer. And if riding a Huffy wasn't cool already, rigging up a little computer with a wired sensor for tracking speed, distance, time, and calories definitely subtracted points. I didn't start logging individual rides until much later, but I do remember hitting the 500 mile mark on the odometer at some point. As a kid, that felt like a monumental number, and I think it definitely planted a bean-counting seed in my mind that would later grow into the monstrous beanstalk of statistics that I maintain to this day. That may make me a nerd, but I think it's important to keep track of the incremental progress that adds up to something bigger in the long run. And knowing what time it is never hurts. Once I got a little older and started my first job delivering newspapers, I was able to combine my savings with a little financing from mom and buy a shiny new BMX bike. This was a big deal for me as saving money has always been an intrinsic value. Not only that, but taking on debt meant that I had a responsibility to keep that job or else mom was coming after me. But the risk was worth the reward in the form of my 13-year-old dream bike in chrome with the black GT fan mags. This was actually the only time I've gone to a bike store and purchased a bike brand new. I still consider this a beautiful bike, and apparently others do too. I think mine was sold in a garage sale for $20, but that's nostalgia, I suppose. After this, I'd move on to high school and cars and a more grown-up job, and for a few years I didn't ride bikes at all. That changed in college when my dad picked up two Huffy Howler full suspension mountain bikes from Kmart. Huffy again was not the strongest name in mountain biking, but we didn't know any better. These bikes were a reintroduction to riding and a way to explore some local trails. And for what they were, they were a lot of fun. These bikes also provided some painful lessons in value, starting with the obvious squeal of the brakes and frustrating inconsistent shifting and frequent chain drops. The heavy suspension components were just for looks, offering only useless bounciness and additional rattles over time. And eventually the crank arms started falling off, resulting in several caveman-style repairs on the trail. 
Looking back now, I definitely have fond memories of this era of my cycling past. This was the start of regular rides with my dad, and once or twice a week we'd ride five miles or so. Definitely not jumping in too deeply yet, but getting a feel for cycling again in my adult life. From there, I took a significant upgrade in the form of a loaner bike from my wife's cousin. Thanks again, Jeff. This bike offered a huge step up from the Huffy in terms of functionality and sizing and just the quality of the components. On single track mountain bike trails, the difference was obvious. There really was no comparison. It went from, I don't think I can even do this sport, to, wow, this is a ton of fun and I feel locked in and stable on this bike. And I really did mesh with this bike. I think one thing that this taught me coming from a very cheap bike to what I knew at the time was a very expensive bike is that my expectation of the bike's capabilities gave me confidence. How much of that was in my head, I can't say, but I found that I wanted to push further than I thought I was capable of. From riding more technical trails to eventually increasing the distance on paths and road, this is where I started to push what I perceived to be the limits of my abilities, and I think that goes hand in hand with the capabilities of the machine I was riding. And of course, there's the cyclo computer. I believe this is from the first time I completed an end-to-end -end ride on a local gravel trail totaling 24 miles. One other milestone that I was proud to hit while in possession of this bike was clocking over 1,000 miles on it. A lot of that was on pretty forgiving paths and road where the suspension doesn't really help. I remember being fascinated with the idea of going further each time and setting out with a goal to find the end of a path before turning around, whatever that meant in terms of mileage. That spirit of exploration has definitely stuck with me and I'm really grateful to have had the opportunity to ride this caliber of a bike at that stage in my life because it gave me a sense of what a bike could offer complementary to my efforts. In the meantime, the cycling bug had hit me, and biking and bikes were on my mind at all times. One thing that happens when you consume yourself with a subject is that the world seems to respond, and you tend to notice that thing more often. Another thing that happens is opportunities seem to appear that you might not have normally picked up on. One of those opportunities for me was this late 90s Fuji Thrill mountain bike that I picked up off the curb for free. It needed a seat and some tubes and tires, but otherwise was in pretty good shape. This bike was clearly too small for me, but with a nearly infinite extending seat post, I could make it fit pretty comfortably. I rode it a few times as a mountain bike before picking up the Diamondback loaner from Jeff, but at some point I decided to try to convert it to more of a hybrid by adding specialized Fatboy slick tires for the 26-inch mountain bike rims. That essentially turned this into a gravel and paved trail destroying hybrid and I really started to chew up the miles with this bike. In terms of lessons learned, I think the bike being free gave me a license to try working on it and customizing things that I normally might not because I didn't have much to lose. It helped me to realize that I could do a lot without making a huge investment in a bike at that time. The tires were the most expensive part and I think I probably spent about $50. But once I was able to hit the same distances I was getting on the mountain bike, clearly with a much higher average speed and less rolling resistance, I felt like now is the time to start seeing where my actual limits are. A bike like this that really isn't offering anything in terms of advantage just gets out of the way and lets me do my thing. That's something that I definitely still consider as part of the value proposition of a bicycle today. I ended up putting just over a thousand miles on this bike before upgrading to my next bike, the Jamis Aurora. This was the first bike that I purchased as an adult. This was the first time that I sat down and considered what I was looking to get out of the sport based on my experiences so far. And in the process, I test rode several different levels of bicycles during this time, from aluminum to full carbon. But I found that I wasn't really impressed with those test rides, especially given what I knew I was able to get out of a free bike like the Fuji. I felt like maybe my expectations were too high, so I test rode some more entry-level priced bikes and during that process came across this steel-framed Chamas. It was a bit more of a classic road bike in appearance with its slender steel tubing and threaded headset, but the ride quality was there. I found out later that the frame was made from Reynolds steel, which is particularly renowned for its compliant and sprightly ride. It's not the lightest or most nimble, obviously, but certainly very durable and capable. 
What I found was that for the money, the ride quality the Jamis offered fit my expectations much better, and I felt a lot more comfortable spending a few hundred dollars on it rather than a thousand dollars on a flashier, more purpose-built road bike. The bike frame itself held up great over six years and 6,500 miles, but the components had some issues. For whatever reason, the rear wheel seemed to be spoke-cursed and broke spokes on at least three different occasions. I even had the wheel entirely rebuilt with all new DT spokes at a reputable bike shop and that did not stop it. Similarly, this bike seems to invite puncture flats like nothing else I've ridden, and in one season alone I logged more than a dozen separate flat incidents. That issue was mostly mitigated when I finally made the switch to gator skin tires, accepting the lesson that the higher price and weight of quality puncture resistant tires is easily worth it if it means avoiding a roadside repair. There you can see me at the summit of Pikes Peak, clearly in no shape to have summited the mountain on my bike. I just had the bike on my rack from previous riding in Colorado and couldn't resist the photo opportunity. After converting the Jamis to more of a gravel trail setup with bigger knobby tires, the broken spoke problem just became too much to deal with and I didn't want to invest in it further. So I just sort of moved on from this bike. In recent years, I stripped it all down with the intention of turning it into a 1x8 sort of city bike, but I only got as far as stripping it to the bare frame and then left it for other projects. Sadly, it sits in pieces in my basement. Maybe someday. After the Diamondback, I decided to make an investment in a mountain bike for myself. And during that stretch of time, I had a change in direction with regard to what I was looking for in a mountain bike. I found what I wanted in a very minimalist, very beastly redline monocoque 29er. This is a rigid steel, single speed, no frills, absolute workhorse of a mountain bike. I became a bit obsessed with single speed bikes for a short time. I really admired the simple aesthetics and it was liberating to be in the woods, getting into a flow and never thinking about shifting or chain lines or derailers bouncing and getting sticks caught in the mechanism. Being able to zone in on the trail made this a really neat experience. Again, it just feels like the bike gets out of the way and allows you to more directly experience the trail. It is true what they say, one speed is all you need, so long as you don't mind spinning out at 12 miles per hour. So while I appreciate the simplicity of the single speed in the woods, I can definitely see why a range of at least eight gears is helpful for anything with a flatter, less technical terrain. I still have this bike, although I haven't ridden it in several years just because I've been focused on mileage goals. I also had one of my most expensive injuries while riding this bike. However, I have no intention of letting go of my Monster Truck 29er and I will definitely get back out there on it soon. As I got more into different types of riding scenarios spanning road, trail, and single track, I became curious about the trend toward hybrid bikes, which were sort of a relaxed road geometry with more of a mountain bike cockpit with flat bars and trigger shifters. I thought this would be a good bike to have in between my road and mountain bikes, but as it turns out, with anything that attempts to be a Swiss army knife, it tends to do many things, but none of them as well as something that was made for a specific purpose. I will admit that I was mostly drawn to this murdered out black theme that they had going on. I think this bike looks great, and I had aspirations of doing more commuting and casual cycling over shorter distances, but I just never really meshed well with it. I remember the ride being somewhat harsh for some reason, but mostly it just never felt like the right bike for anything. I ended up parting ways with it after only 11 rides. I did keep the clipless pedals and cleats that were sold to me with the bike, and I ended up using them full time on the Jamas. So this bike indirectly served as my introduction to riding clipped in, which I have stuck with to this day. Despite my initial apprehension, I found that the efficiency and feeling of connection to the bike through clipless pedals is worth the brief learning curve. My first legitimate modern road bike was a specialized sector. It has the endurance road geometry of the Roubaix, but an aluminum frame rather than full carbon. I splurged somewhat on this bike, rewarding myself after many years and thousands of miles of riding. Looking back now, I would say it was worth it. This bike was excellent and really left nothing to be desired. This was the bike that I used in my first time trial and triathlon races and still holds the fastest average speeds over many of my regular routes. 
This was probably the first of my bikes that not only didn't hinder my experience, but enhanced it in several ways. Whether that was the proprietary Zertz inserts on the frame and fork or the overall geometry, it was a comfortable and efficient road bike that reliably served me for over 6,000 miles. I think the only thing that ever really happened on this bike was a cable break, which taught me the lesson that you just need to change your cables while they're still working. It's a $5 part and takes 5 minutes, so instead of limping home in the hardest gear and picking twisted splinters of broken cable out of your shift housings, just change the cable before it breaks. I was watching Craigslist almost constantly by this point, hunting for anything interesting or appealing that might come up. And I would come across listings like this one where someone posted the bike for $100, which is an absolute no-brainer given that there are a few parts on it that are worth that alone. I immediately contacted the seller and scheduled to come pick it up. In the meantime, he responded to tell me that a few other people had offered more than the asking price and he wanted to know if I could increase my offer. I didn't want to get into a bidding war, so I wished him luck and went about my day. A bit later, he called me back and said he was tired of dealing with the runaround of people on Craigslist and that if I could come get it that day, I could have it for $200. I accepted and took possession of what I believe now is the best value bicycle I've ever owned. As it came, this bike was set up as a cyclocross with knobby tires. Having a spare wheel set with road tires and matching cassette gears meant this bike was very versatile with only a quick wheel swap to go from gravel to road. I always loved the cyclocross aesthetic with its wide, beefy fork and cantilever brakes that leave a ton of room for tire clearance. This bike again was a lesson in value because even having spent less than a quarter of what I spent on my Specialized, this bike was every bit as good. This became the bike that I've ridden the most by quite a lot, topping out at just under 13,000 miles and 467 rides. The only reason I'm not still riding this bike is because one day after cleaning some accumulated grime off, I discovered this rather sprawling crack near the bottom bracket. Despite not experiencing any sort of symptoms of this crack, it definitely looked like it was advancing around the seat tube and I wanted no part of that. Still, for the performance I got out of this cheap entry-level dick sporting goods bike, I feel like I got every bit of my money's worth out of it. If I could, I would order another one just like it, and it would be my daily grinder without question. My most recently acquired bike, and the one that has appeared in all of these videos so far, is the Cannondale CAD 10. This was another result of spending too much time on Craigslist, and I didn't really need another road bike, but I really wanted it because of its look. I loved the unpainted aluminum and carbon, black and silver palette with its aggressive racing posture. I wanted this to be my dream bike, and while I rode it a fair amount, it didn't offer me anything that was leagues ahead of what I was used to. It was functional and light with its SRAM rival component group, it just never really clicked with me. In recent years, I ended up downgrading it from rival to Shimano Claris just to have the familiar shifting system and compatibility between sets of wheels and cassettes I already owned. And after the Diamondback crack was discovered, I transferred some additional parts over to set it up in an endurance road posture with a more relaxed stem and saddle. For the last two years of back-to-back 3,500-mile -back grinds, this has been my bike 100% of the time. I think it's difficult to know what lessons you may be currently in the process of learning. Perhaps this is the bike that will teach me about stagnation and sticking with something that doesn't feel quite right for too long. It's been almost seven years since I've test ridden a new bike, so it's very possible I've let my expectations decline along the way. I still hold out hope for finding my upper echelon dream bike, but for now I know there's still a lot of ways I can push myself before exceeding the limits of the bikes I have. Which brings us back to now. This was a fun way to relive some memories and see how much I've changed and grown with bikes throughout the years. Bicycles have been a part of my life since I was a kid. Some of my clearest and fondest memories are of the days of adolescence when a bike was always nearby. It was our way around, our most dangerous thrill ride, and our prized possession. I think that biking teaches us a lot of lasting lessons, from handling the responsibility of finally being able to outrun our parents, to being mindful of our surroundings and knowing that motorists won't always be watching out for us. A good bike seems to multiply your effort and carry you further and faster than you believed you could go. 
For me, even through all the miserable wind and drop chains and floppy, stupid, flat tires, it keeps being worth it. And I'm happy to look back over the years and see a bicycle for every era, each taking me to new places in unique ways and leaving a lasting impression. All the way back to the first day I developed that famously unforgettable skill that all unforgettable skills are compared to. So how did I get here? Riding a bicycle. <laughs>